see, ma, ma band father, when we lived up on the side of the Stanthorpe, found two little girls in the bush. Two little girls. And they both had a tag on their chest. They were little fair haired Aboriginal kids. And one was called Winsome, that's what it had on the card, and the other one had Joan. My grandfather brought him home. Somebody had left them there because that was the time of the stolen generation and kids were being stolen. People panicked and they got scared, but they knew that we would never leave anyone. And that's, and that's, that's true. And those two girls were with me for right up to just recently. And I, when, I, when, they, when they went that time, they died. All mum did was put them in the foot of the girls, my sisters, chuck another cup of water on the soup, in the soup. Enough to go around. I think I was 10 years of age when the government brought us out and brought us down to New South Wales, money 32. But we come down under guard too. And I, I, I'd, I'd never seen the white but We walked every step of the way. And uh, I was afraid that wouldn't worry because we, we, we walked. Anyway, this was long ever before motor cars. And we never had any motor cars around up that way. They used to have the cars that used to come for the kids, for the children. Very sad, 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 terrible times they were. And, 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 and the old lady, one of the old ladies turned, I don't know, she must, I used to call her auntie, but I don't know whether she was an auntie or not. But she turned, she ran, and they brought her back. She said, she wasn't going to, didn't want to move. Out of her, out of her, out of her country, and uh, anyway, we camped on the river at uh, Bonshaw, and the next morning she was gone. She'd run. Mum said she'll go back into the bush, and that's where she'll be. She'll die there. But at least she never left. She wouldn't. We 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 were very very strong about about their country our land because it's ours. Anyway, and uh, I said, I'll never, I'll never ever forget that. When we came down to Bonshaw, that's when they split us up. They sent some to Moree, three or four to Moree, a couple of families to Glen Innes, Armadale, uh, Inderell, and my, my family was sent to Ashford, a little place called Ashford. 25 miles from Bonshaw, and it was that a mission. On Dead Bird Mission, I was on Dead Bird Mission. And when we got to Dead Bird Mission, there was more, a couple of more worry, Namba, Narwan, Gomoroi, Wiradjuri. We couldn't understand each other. We spoke different dialects. And we, uh, and that's another thing too I learnt later. There was a method in their madness. You take the, take the culture, take the, you take the language, you take the culture. And that's what, it, that's what it was all about. They'd never done anything that they didn't have to do. And, uh, that's where I started to learn. Uh, there's other things in this world besides Aboriginals' culture living like, like a, as, as, as an Aboriginal. The missions were no joke in those days. And they used to put the tag around our necks when we went to town to, to, to say that we had to be back on the mission by five o'clock. 
And at four o'clock of an afternoon, the police would walk through town and put every, all the Aboriginals out. And, uh, but I, I didn't know any better because I'd, I'd never seen anything else. There was a school, but it was an area school. And that means everybody in the area went to the one school. And it was laid out in a horseshoe fashion, <laughs> in shape. All the classes, the Aboriginal classroom was away. Then it was four posts to put in the ground, net and wire on top, and leaves on the top. And then we were not allowed. When them, the, um, the women used to walk down from the mission every day to bring water because we were not allowed to drink the water out of the tanks in the school. We were not allowed to mix with the, with the, with the, with the other children in the school. And they only allowed 18 because it was a, just a, a bow shed. And uh, there was no desk. It was uh, a, a half a tree. But, uh, and uh, it had slates. Didn't have pens or pencils, nothing like that. It had slates tied to the tree. Anyway, and they said, well, 18. In those days, when you were six year old, you started school. And when you were six, with a six year old started school, the oldest one had to leave. I think I was three months at school, then I had to leave. I was out in the bush, I was working in a ring barking camp, a water boy. You know, the, uh, the Hessian water bags? I was running from Dava to, to keep, keep the water up to the men. And, uh, well, never knew what work was to then. <laughs> And uh, and big areas we were running over, and uh, but it was a, it was something that then I knew this was going to be the rest of my life. I thought I've had to do it. In those days, I didn't have Centrelink. The only money you had was what you earned. The government used to come and take so much of that too. Always said that we were going to get it back, but I'm still waiting for mine. My mum said. The stories will come. Look, and I said, oh, and that, 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 that's when I found out that I was going to be the storyteller. And, and I was that keen. And she said, no, the, 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 the stories will come. You'll, you'll know. Anyway, I, I never told stories on my mission. My mum wanted to go home to Tasmania and we ran away from the mission. And uh, we got to Sydney, and the, uh, the timber boats from Tasmania were bringing up the, the famous Ewan Pine, King Billy Pine, and uh, we got a ride back to Tasmania with a, and we, we tied a, the, when we just, the ship just, Tied up at the wharf, and we got about a hundred yards away, and they had us. Put us. They sent us back, train back to the Launceston up that way, and crossed it in the boat. Then on the train back to Sydney, and three times, three times, we ran away. Three times they brought us back. The fourth time they let us stay there. It was, must have been costing them too much. I let mum stay there. And she uh, she died there. And then this uh, this whole life of mine, I've seen it, I've seen a lot, done a lot. Done a lot of things that I shouldn't have done too. I'm a, I'm no angel. But uh, but I've done things like this, you know. I've jumped the fence knocking off a sheep. Right next to the mission, jumped the fence. And you want to know, I used to, if I was going to knock up a sheep, I'd go and grab 
get one of the men or two of the men to uh, this is on the quiet. We're going to ask the sheep tonight, right? They would sneak off, get a sheep, kill him, they'd get him in the dark, bring him back, and everybody on the mission would be standing there waiting for <laughs> <laughs> they always do. Tend to know. When you're hungry, anything tastes good, you know. And uh, and that's when people are at their best. When they're hungry, they start to. I got to get a few. Where do I get it from? You know. Do I jump the fence? Do I do this? And we had some elders there. And they were old men. And somehow or other, they would get out of the mission of a night and they would run. I believe they run to Inverell, 35 miles away, go through the offal at the meatworks and be back on the mission by dawn. But anyway, they caught, must have caught, they caught them. And they were chained leg to leg so they couldn't do it. And anyway, one morning, they woke up and chains were there and they were gone. Then we never saw them again. But they'd done what they were supposed to do. And that's what the elders do. Look after the look after. Everybody come before you. The old elder there was a man man by the name of Colin Brown. Uh, a good old oh, a, 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 a wonderful man. And he took me under his wing. Whenever I got into trouble on a mission, I used to run away and hide. I had this little place where I could go. I could get in there. No one could find me. Eh? And uh, I was there, and I found a stone that was there in front of me, like a gra glass stone, grass. I picked it up, and it was like it was moving. It was warm, hot. So I took it up to the old man. And he said, it's a power stone. It's for you. Or you wouldn't have found it. So carry it with you always. Do not let it go. He said, when the time comes for you to let it go, you'll know. And then, all right. So anyway, I had the stone. I lost it four or five times, maybe more. Always seemed to turn up, and I, I carried it in my swag when I wandered around when I was a, when I was a man, and I come to Sydney, I still had it, and I met a man by the name of Barry Corr, and he used to he was part of Aboriginal, and he used to work for the education department. He was a history teacher at university at one time or other. And we become great friends. And he was trying to get me into the schools to tell stories. And that, well, they didn't want to borrow us. And, uh, but he kept, he kept at it and kept at it. And then one day, he rang me up. He said, can you come down? I said, all right. So I got up and I'm ready to go and I picked up the stone. It was cold. Without thinking, I put it in my pocket. Anyway, I get down there. And I'm in the office talking to Barry. And uh, he, I said, are you all right? You don't look well. He said, last night, my daughter was born with her insides on the outside. He said, and I don't know what to do. And without thinking, I put my hand in my pocket and I pulled the stone out. I said, hold your hand out. He put his hand out and I put the stone. He said, that effing thing to lies. And I said, well, that's yours. He took it down. Oh, I believe he hung it around his baby's neck. And after about eight or nine or ten, I don't know how many operations, these girls are still there today. And uh, when he and I, we sort of broke up. 
the he got me into the stores, he remembered. And I said to him, only a couple of weeks ago, I said, I never said a thank you, did I, for getting me into the stores? He said, no. I never had the knowledge. I just pushed. I just pushed, he said. And uh, one, one night, I was up at the Holy Family and I was doing a thing called what they call fire bucket. It was a thing that I'd done and I toured with it. It was very big in my life. And I, and when I've, and I, I got a loss for words, couldn't, and I remembered it. I said, I started talking about this stone, see? And what had happened, see? And I've, and I, and I've just finished and there must have been a hundred and you were there, weren't you, Doc? A hundred and fifty people there, more. And this one man stood up, Siobhan Barrycourt. Out of all the men, the people in Sydney, he was there. And he came up, he said, this every word of that's true. I still have the stone. And then I'm standing there and this, Somebody kissed him in the back of my neck. I looked around, it was a little girl, about 22, 21. And she said, I owe you. My dad told me that I owe you. And I, believe it or not, and I saw him the other day, he said, I've got four more girls now, he said, and they've all had the stone around their neck. And he still carries the stone with him today. But he took me down to the education department. He said, go in there. So I went in, and there was a big mob of people in there. And he said, we've just voted to see whether we allow you into schools or not. And then I, then I said, then there was... There's 42 teachers here. He said, and we got 20 who didn't want it. So you win, 22. He said, we're gonna let you into the schools to tell stories. And then they hit me with that three letter word, but. But that's what you're here for, dream time stories. You're not allowed to talk about the first fluke. Not allowed to talk about the Stalin generation. Not allowed to talk about early settlers. Not allowed to talk about killing, massacres, Stalin land. Dream time stories. That's all. And if you can't, and if you get off the march, you're out. I went outside to Barry Cora. I said, I'm not going to do this. He said, you've got to do it. I said, no, I don't suggest you do, he said. The thousands of kids waiting for you. Waiting for your story. And I told Dreamtime stories for 16 years. <laughs> Too scared to make a mistake, you know, because I was right and I've got to be out. And I was down at uh, Westmead at a, at a girls' Catholic school. And I was having a cup of tea with the principal, the woman principal. And she said, do the girls have any questions? And I said, yeah, but I'm not allowed to answer. And she said, well, I say you are. I said, I don't know. She said, this is my school. And I'm telling you that if they want to know something and you ain't know, you tell them. I said, well, we're going to get into a lot of trouble, you and I. And she said, well, you let me deal with that. But she'd never done this in the first place. I said, all right. So I went back in. They'd done whatever she told me to do. And anyway, I, no one said nothing about it. And since then, we gradually got more and more now. I can say anything I want, I give in. And, uh, and, I, and I think there was a lesson that I learned in was to control myself. I've never, up to that time, I don't think I ever tried to control myself, you know.